this week on Vaticano, we take you to the 52nd International Eucharistic Congress in Budapest, Hungary. Take a tour of Hungary's capital city, learn the stories of some of the local people joining in the celebration, and participate in the closing mass and blessing with Pope Francis. For this and more, Vaticano starts now. At the very beginning of our journey here in Budapest, we just got here and Matthews and I had first trip to Budapest and we are very excited for you to go around Budapest. Behind me we have some of the most incredible sites, Parliament and St. Stephen's Basilica. We're here on this journey we want to bring to you. Matthew, tell us a little bit about Budapest, the Pest side and also the Buddha side. Well, as you can see right behind us is the Great Danube River, which is uh, coursing through Central Europe. It is uh, the home of the Hungarian people. It is a home and sort of the, the key to understanding Budapest and why it has always been of such interest. The history of Budapest goes back a long way, all the way back to the Roman Empire, in fact. Mm -hmm. This was called Aquincum. It was part of uh, what was called the Pannonian province for the Romans. It was very important to them commercially and militarily. That military and economic importance, well, it continued all the way through the centuries. The Hungarians have survived Mongol invasions. They survived Ottoman Turk invasions. They survived the brutal fighting of World War II, as well as the 1956 suppression of the longing for freedom. Through all of that history has been the Catholic faith, which is one of the key anchors and absolutely vital to understanding Hungary and its people. We see all throughout uh, this coverage we're gonna see national identity and also religious identity. I think that's where, one thing that you will see anchored within the Hungarian people and nation. Let's also remember why we're here. And yes. that is the 52nd International Eucharistic Congress. We're gonna be here for an entire week covering all of the events with the focus on the Eucharist, with the focus on deepening our love of the real presence. This is just the start of a journey and you and I are gonna start a small journey across Budapest. Let's get going. Let's get going. So, Father, here we are at the co-cathedral of St. Stephen, the cathedral church, a co-cathedral church for the Archdiocese of uh, Budapest, Estragon. What do you think? It's really stunning going inside. I'm, outside is stunning, but going inside and actually seeing the architecture itself, it really preserves the faith of the Hungarian people. One of the things that is so striking uh, when you look at this church is it's a neoclassical design. Uh, so it, it's very evocative of uh, ancient times. And yet, this was built and completed in 1905, so it's a very modern structure. In the church, we have a relic, the Holy Dexter, as it's called. Yeah, the holy right hand of Saint Stephen, King of Hungary. I think that for Hungarians, the faith that he passed on, the faith that he wanted to you know, build as a foundation for the Hungarian people. He wanted that for generations to come. So here we are at St. Elizabeth Church. And Father, this is a church that was built, uh, ancient as it looks, uh, similar to St. Stephen's Basilica in 1901. I think being in Hungary, just the, the foundation of Hungary is built upon these spiritual giants. And St. Stephen of Hungary laid the foundation for what a couple of centuries later would be St. Elizabeth of Hungary, being that spiritual giant that she is. Now she died at the age of only 24, was yes. a widow at 20, but there are so many stories, especially that the Hungarians have preserved. What are two of the most interesting? Well, I think the most interesting one is her giving um, bread to the poor, and her husband was a little bit suspicious and told her to reveal the what she had underneath, you know, and she revealed it, and it wasn't bread, but it turned into roses. One other 
amazing aspect to this church was the discovery, uh, not that many years ago, of a set of mosaics, so sort of the fragments of a mosaic that had been covered over during the Ottoman Muslim occupation. What did we see there? We saw Our Lady holding the Christ child behind uh, the altar, and it was revealed not re very recently, actually. Yeah, that revealing of the history, uh, so many small details that come to life. Well, you can try and cover things up. I think right. people throughout history, you can try and cover up, you know, the religious faith of people, but these churches show the deep depth of the faith of the Hungarian people. We're now in Holy Trinity Square overlooking the Danube River, and behind me is Matthias Church and also a beautiful statue of St. Stephen. This church was actually founded by St. Stephen of Hungary. The church itself is called the Matthias Church, an honor not of a saint, uh, but of Matthias Corvinus, who's one of the greatest of the kings of Hungary. And the history of the church itself is complicated in the sense that it, for a while it wasn't even a church. It was taken over at one point by the Ottoman Turks who converted it into a mosque. And there's a story relating to the Blessed Mother uh, that there was a statue of her that was hidden by the Hungarians from the Turks out of fear that they would destroy it. And it uh, disappeared for about a hundred and some years. And then in 1686, when the Hungarians were able to recapture Buda, uh, a cannonball landed in the mosque and hit part of the wall right at the time when Ottoman soldiers, Ottoman troops were praying, hoping uh, to sort of be saved from the Hungarians. Well, when the wall itself fell and the cannonball did its work, sure enough, there was the statue of the Blessed Mother. It completely demoralized the Ottoman troops and was crucial in the Hungarian victory in recapturing and then reconverting this church back to a church. Since then, there have been a number of renovations, but this is still a very important spiritual center in the history of Hungary. And there are a few other kings that were crowned here as well. That's right. Including a blessed. One of them was uh, Charles IV of Hungary, who uh, became king of Hungary, but then was also the emperor of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. It turns out the last emperor of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, who's also now a blessed, blessed Karl. Blessed Karl, pray for us. Father, this is uh, truly an extraordinary church. What we're in, of course, is uh, a church dedicated to the Blessed Mother, but this is, uh, for obvious reasons, uh, considered the cave church. And it is a church that has deep roots in the hermits who lived here. St. Ivan is one here on Gellert Hill in Budapest. Uh, but it also has a, a great history of martyrdom. Yes. But let's remember, too, that this is a functioning church. Yeah, functioning church. They have daily mass here, daily confessions. And I've been in caves in Colorado, a little cave in Lourdes, France. But this cave is really unique as it is. Right behind us, um, the Blessed Sacrament is reserved for people to pray in adoration. They have a, a crucifix here, which they, they call the Olympias Crucifix, which is a replica of a one in Spain. If you notice, this crucifix is not of the dead Christ, of the, of the corpus of the dead Christ, but this corpus is of Jesus actually living. You know, his side has not been pierced yet, so he's offering himself in suffering to the Father. I think a lot of people, all of us can identify with that, what suffering means in our life. And that idea of suffering on the part of our Lord, reminds us too of the intense martyrdom that took place on this hill. In fact, uh, we go all the way back to about 1024 when the person who gave his name to this hill, St. Gellert or St. Gerard, was murdered by pagans. Uh, by tradition, he was stuffed into a barrel filled with spikes and rolled down this very hill. If we jump ahead centuries uh, all the way to 1951 after the takeover of Hungary by the Soviet uh, atheist regime, uh, we have the arrest of the Pauline monks who lived here and who are still here. Uh, they were taken away. One of the heads of the community was executed and the others were sent into forced labor. After the fall of communism, uh, they were able to come back to this cave. And of course, what they found too was that the entrance had been blocked, filled with concrete by the Soviets, by the atheist communists, trying to prevent people from coming here to pray and to celebrate mass. But with that new freedom, that concrete was removed, the church began to function again, 
and it remains today a real spiritual powerhouse here in Budapest. Well, here we are at our last stop of this whirlwind tour of Budapest. This is the, uh, the Parliament building for Budapest and Father, a more beautiful setting to wrap things up I don't oh, think we could find. Just stunning. I mean, it just shows you the national identity of this country, not just their religious identity, but just a national identity as well. Inside this building, uh, we have been visiting, for example, St. Stephen's Basilica, is the crown of the kings of Hungary. This is uh, one of those great national treasures. We, by tradition, are told that the crown was given to St. Stephen by a Pope, St. Sylvester II. For all of us who are here for the International Eucharistic Congress, it has one more little connection. That's really significant that we would start out here with adoration with our Eucharistic King, to start out here and then process to Hero Square. After the break, meet Jolt Carl, a local pastry chef who created a heavenly dessert for the Eucharistic Congress. Hello, coming to my pastry shop. This pastry shop has been operating since 1996. It's a family business. On the left, you can see the handmade ice cream. Everything is made with natural ingredients. On my right, there are cakes, pastries, buns. And here you can see this very typical Hungarian creamy cake. This is Zolt Karel, who won Pastry of the Congress, a competition to produce pastries for the International Eucharistic Congress. But the catch? All ingredients must be found somewhere in the Bible. Bite of Heaven, that's what it's called. I used Bailey Da as a base and made a 50 to 60 gram small cake out of it. I was required to use the ingredients in the Bible, like dried fruits, seeds, wine and olives. So I drew from it. I chose roasted almonds and I cooked it all up with honey cinnamon water. The cake is stuffed with these dried fruits that I cut into smaller cubes. So that's why we call it the Bite of Heaven. Contestants had to meet several criteria, including making sure their delicacies were suitable for packaging and storing without refrigeration. It was actually the second or third try before I got it right. What was even more challenging was that the fruits were very dry and it was difficult to get them, so now I bought half of them from Paris, from the market. After submissions were narrowed down to seven finalists, pastry chef Zolt Carroll emerged as the winner with his cookie christened A Bite of Heaven. And according to the jury, he wonderfully managed to combine Hungarian confectionery traditions with the ingredients present in the Bible. Oranges, almonds, figs, dates, plums, apricots, and honey are all featured in his winning creation. Very delicious. It tastes good. This is made out of Bratislava pasta. That is how we call it here. You can taste the dry fruits very well. The cookies have already been given to the 1,300 children who made their first communion at the Congress's opening mass. In Hungary, our Cardinal Peter Erdő and some of the clergy have already tasted it. They also made 200 pieces to distribute it to the poor, so they can have it with their meals. I'm standing in an area called District 7, right in the heart of Budapest, otherwise known as the Jewish Quarter. 
Now today, it's filled with trendy bars and fancy art galleries, but traditionally, this is where the Jewish community called home. And right over here, their pride and joy, because this is the Dohan Street Synagogue, also known as the Great Synagogue, because it is the largest synagogue in all of Europe. And tonight, people are gathering here of all faith backgrounds for a very special concert. Built in 1859, this synagogue stands as a proud symbol of the Jewish people and their faith, who for years here in Hungary were not even permitted to build such a structure. And tonight's performance is highly symbolic as both religions, Christianity and Judaism, are coming together to be unified by music. Hungarian Cardinal Peter Erdo, as well as other officials from the Catholic Church, are in attendance. Robert Froelich is the chief rabbi of this synagogue. The speciality of this night was the audience because there was never such an evening in the history of the synagogue that about uh, 50 clergymen, high-ranked clergymen, arrived to the synagogue for a concert. As Hungary is playing host to the Eucharistic Congress and Pope Francis will be visiting the country, Rabbi Froelich wanted to answer the Pope's call for interreligious dialogue. As a, a prelude to his visit, we made here a concert to show the common ground of the two great monotheistic religions, the uh, Christianity and the Judaism. The Saltai Chamber Orchestra performs pieces from both Jewish and Christian composers, intertwined in harmony. Sister Angelica Snyder is a Dominican sister based in Hungary and was in the audience. This uh, performance was a real uh, moment of dialogue between the two faiths or the two religions. There are also choral and solo performances, their haunting voices echoing through the magnificent synagogue. We showed that if we can sing together, we have the common ground, maybe we can live together in peace. We try to reflect on, on our uh, common uh, grounds and our common uh, funda foundations of our faith. I feel that uh, God is really uh, present here. So this is the house of, of prayer. Uh, for everybody. When they built this synagogue, they said that it would symbolize integration, remembrance, and an openness to all. And tonight's concert is a perfect example of that, bringing people together, united by music, and focusing on the things we have in common, rather than the differences between us. After the break, meet Kata Lincher Messey, an artist who used her background in architecture to create the stunning monstrance for the Eucharistic Congress. A sacred object always has a different meaning. It's a spiritual process. When making a particular object, say a relic, one reads the story of the saint a little, and inevitably he or she meditates on it while making the object for the saint. 
Kara lenzer Mezzi is the artist who created the monstrance for the Budapest International Eucharistic Congress. Now we are in my goldsmith's workshop in Buda, where I usually make jewelry and other small objects. It's a perfect workshop, getting better equipped each year, and it's also very enjoyable to work here. I have been working in this industry for a little over 10 years. I completed a jewelry design course in Milan in 2009 and a goldsmith course here in Budapest in 2010. In 2018, the Eucharistic Congress organized the competition for the design and production of the monstrance to be used as a central piece across the Eucharistic Congress which Kara decided to enter. I looked and searched for inspiration, of course, but the truth is that there are very few contemporary ecclesiastical works of art, especially on this scale. Having previously worked as an architect for 15 years, for Kara, this was invaluable now that she had to design and build the monstrance. As a goldsmith, I hadn't worked with other workshops or subcontractors before. So the hardest part was coordinating these different workshops who could help me with the kind of work I can't do. For example, I worked with a locksmith workshop and a glass workshop. Her design develops upwards from the pedestal to the sacrament, making it the focal point. It took more than a semester to make the process and my materials were stainless steel with gold-plated copper inserts and glass accessories. And this holder itself, the monstrance, is made out of silver and gilded silver with a halo around it. With the unanimous decision of the jury, Kata's design was announced as the winner. And this week, the monstrance is at the center of the Eucharistic Congress, holding and protecting the very thing this whole Congress is about, the Holy Eucharist. <laughs> Well, it's a great honor, and of course I'm very happy about it, and I'm excited about the Pope's visit. With the International Eucharistic Congress coming to an end, the closing mass brings images that mirror pre-pandemic papal trips. Dense masses of people assembling along the sides of the road, reaching to be close to the Holy Father. Thousands of the faithful follow closely behind Pope Francis, presenting little children to him for a blessing and a kiss. In his homily, Pope Francis calls all of Christendom to renew discipleship in three specific steps, professing Jesus, discerning with Jesus, and following Jesus. The Holy Mass starts with an invitation for the audience to ask themselves the same question that Jesus asked the disciples. Who am I, in fact, for you? Who am I for you? This question, addressed to each of us, calls for more than a quick answer straight out of the Catechism. It requires a vital, personal response. The Pope explains that Jesus is the Christ, but the statement lacks the decisive shift from just an admiration of Jesus to imitation of Jesus. He is the Messiah who reveals his identity, the Paschal Lord in the Eucharist, Pope Francis recalls how Jesus explained his mission would reach its climax in the splendor of the resurrection, but it also requires the humiliation of the cross, a shocking announcement that changed history. The Eucharist is here to remind us who God is, 
It does not do so just in words, but in a concrete way, showing us God as bread broken, as love crucified and bestowed. We can add ritual elements, but the Lord is always there in the simplicity of bread ready to be broken distributed and eaten. He is there to save us. Christ became a servant. To give us life, he accepted debt. The Christian journey is not a race towards success. It begins by stepping back. Remember this, the Christian journey begins by stepping back, finding freedom by not needing to be at the center of everything. At the end of his homily, the Pope concluded this 2021 Eucharistic Congress with a message of hope for future challenges. This International Eucharistic Congress marks the end of one journey, but more importantly, the beginning of another. For walking behind Jesus means always looking ahead, welcoming the Kairos of grace and being challenged every day by the Lord's question to each of us, his disciples, who do you say that I am? The Congress is a reminder of the centrality of the Eucharist in our Catholic faith and that it is food for our journey to heaven.